Hey guys, welcome to Pittsburgh. My name is Anthony. I appreciate you joining me this evening. I want to introduce a special guest, uh, Ryan from Breakout Cards. How are you guys? Appreciate you being here, man. And no problem. Thank you. So I wanted to just uh, take a minute just to highlight your channel. If you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself and for anybody that has not yet seen you or watched any of your videos. Sure. All right, guys. My name is Ryan Nolan. Named after the legendary pitcher, Nolan Ryan. I have a YouTube channel over here called Breakout Cards. And every single weekend, I'm going to a different card show throughout the country. So within the last past month or so, I've gone to Wisconsin for the Wisdell show. I've been to Dallas for the Dallas card show. Went to Houston for the TriStar show. Hit up a bunch of local shows throughout Florida, including like the Clearwater Bay Area show, Tampa show, Jacksonville, Miami, you name it. I've probably been to that show. Uh, so that's every weekend I try to go to those different shows. Throughout the week, I also do different uploads as well. So one of my main series is that I do is I spot fake cards. Uh, there's a lot of fake cards going throughout the hobby. So I try to teach my audience how you can spot fake cards, altered cards, and different things like that. So you don't lose money on that. Besides that, all a few other uploads throughout the week, talk about the history of sports cards and then what the market is doing. Nice. I want to say what's up to Joel. I appreciate you being here, man. Hey, thank you. Johnny Jetson's in the house as well. Appreciate what's you up, being Johnny? here, Johnny. Yes, man. I'm excited to have you here because uh, I told you a little bit behind before we started, but man, what you're doing on your channel is like, that's kind of what my goal for my channel is. Like, I want to be able to go to all of the different shows and you know what I mean? So far, I've been kind of bouncing back and forth between Pennsylvania, Ohio every once in a while. Like if I'm away somewhere and they just happen to have one, I'll try to, you know, jump in and check that out as well. But um man going to like all of the different places being able to experience hobby and culture in different states meeting all kinds of different people man that's like that's totally like my goal right now so like i'm excited to be able to pick your brain about that kind of stuff oh absolutely it's a ton of fun hey deb good to see you appreciate you being here nice to meet you deb nice that's awesome Grunt Dad's in the house. Good to see you, my man. Appreciate you being here. How's it going, Grunt? April's in the house. Says, where's my $5 Tua? <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, $5 sale's coming out tomorrow. Promise. <laughs> tomorrow, right around 5 p.m. Eastern time, the $5 sale's coming out. So, appreciate you following up about that because it's been a whirlwind of a week, but uh, I'm excited that finally have that video edited and ready to release. But so let me ask you this, man, like what's been the best show that you've been to and for what reason do you feel just because of like the number of people, the type of inventory they had, or just like the experience you had with other people in the hobby? Yeah. So the easy answer is the national. I mean, I went there in 2019 and really, a really awesome show. I mean, I got culture shock because that was my first big show I went to. I wasn't traveling then. I went with my family. And, you know, walking around, you get to see high-grade 1952 mantles. You get to see some of these tobacco mm -hmm. cards that have, like, a pop 50 or pop 100. Yeah. You see the Super Fractor. I mean, back then, I'm, I was a race fan, so I knew who Wander Franco was. Mm -hmm. And they had a Super Fractor there or Super Factor Auto. I can't remember. Of Wander Franco that someone was selling for, like, $10,000, which now you look at it, you're like, dang, that's probably a good deal. Um, mm -hmm. But – you know, going to that show, seeing all the different booths, the autograph signees there, mm -hmm. that was like the best show I ever went to. Now, this year, some of my two favorite shows. So my favorite show from the standpoint of like how they put together the production wise, um, how yeah. everything was laid out, had to be the Wisconsin Dells card show. Um, nice. I know there's a few other people that went there, didn't like it because it's more vintage cards mm -hmm. rather than just really, really high end slabs. Um, but they had everything going on. That was good to have at a show. On top of that, one thing that people don't realize is they had carpet throughout that entire show. And when you're walking the floor for two days, it makes yeah. a big difference rather than being on cement. Oh, um, another, another show that's awesome, and everyone always goes to the show, is Dallas. And just because of all the different YouTubers that go in there, all the different connections that can be made. And plus, when you have like 500, 600 tables there, you're going to find a lot of cards that you want. Uh, but Absolutely. I'd say those two shows so far this year, it was Dells and then uh, Dallas show those have been my favorites and then I'm going to be going to nationals so that'll nice. probably what's uh, that nice I'm planning to go to nationals hopefully if I do I'll see you there uh be cool uh, to be in person man um 100%. No, I definitely want to go to like one of the Dallas shows this year as well 
because that just looks awesome. It is. You know what the problem though with Dallas is they're going to have it the same weekend as the big Atlanta show. So I don't know yet if I'm going to Dallas yet because the Atlanta show, um, I got to support the local community from Orlando, but the guy who runs it always goes to all the different local shows down here. Nice. Yeah. It's pro- probably like the same. It is with like Pennsylvania and Ohio since we're like neighbors and stuff where you see like a lot of guys cross over from, you know, shows and it's only like, you know, a couple hours. Oh yeah. It's not too bad at all. Mm-hmm. So that's cool, man. Yeah. I'm going to definitely have to go check that stuff out. I never would have thought to check out Wisconsin Dells. So it was that's, great. That's awesome, man. Like I I've heard of Wisconsin Dells just because I know some people that live there, but like, I, I never would have thought like Wisconsin would be a pop in place for the hobby. That's awesome, man. I guess with I gotta, the being there, it would be kind of. I was going to say, yeah. yeah, it was a really fun show. I mean, they have it and literally like a resort there. So, I mean, they have like a mini theme park there. They also have a bunch of water slides, like a full on water park within uh, the resort as well. And awesome. it's, it's fun. They had a, they had a trade night as well. VIP trade right. night they had after and inside they had a bunch of different carnival games. So you had different YouTubers that are playing basketball against each other. Ski ball. Um, there's darts there. They had brought catered food. Like they did everything right that you would want to yeah. see at a card show there. Dude, like I'm like feeling jealous for my city right now because like we don't <laughs> like we have card shows, but we don't have like water slides and cool stuff like that. Like, come on, Pittsburgh, we need to step up and do something extravagant for the people here. Maybe That's you should movie, run one. Man. That's super cool. What's what's the number one show that you want to go to that you haven't had a chance to go to yet? I'd probably say it's what we were talking about earlier. I think it was what Strongsville in Ohio just visits a vintage only show. Yeah. And that's what I collect. I collect a lot more vintage. I mean, sure, I dabble with modern stuff as well. You have to. You can't completely ignore it. But my main PC is vintage, so I'd rather go to that show. Mm-hmm. I've heard a ton of things about it from a lot of dealers and people that have gone to the show. So it's probably towards the top of my list. Mm-hmm. Um, there's probably a few other shows that I want to go to. I'd have to do a little more research first. I know there's a big show in New York as well. They have the show in Virginia and the Philly show. So those are all my list as well. That's awesome. Joel makes a really good point. He said they could have a show in the middle of woods and people would go. And like to prove your point, me and my buddy Marty were going to a bunch of LCSs in Ohio, and uh, we met some guy. The, one of the LCSs was closed. I guess the owner had like cataracts or something like that, surgery or something, and they had the place closed. And we didn't know that there was another one close by. And we met this like kind of sketchy looking guy, and he's like, "You guys are looking for slabs?" And like I. <laughs> I'm like, slabs? Somebody's talking about slabs? Like, absolutely. I want to see some slabs. And he's like, yeah, come on, follow me. And, like, we'll go we'll go get some slabs. And I'm, I look at Marty. I'm like, you know, this is a terrible idea. But the guy says he has some slabs. Last time I had that happen, I had to give up cards to the FBI. Really? Wow. Yeah, it was a, it was a whole odd situation. I mean, we could talk about it forever. But yeah, it's on my channel if anyone wants to watch it. That shows you some of the dark side of the hobby. Yeah, definitely. What's going on, Sharon? Good to see you. Appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks, Sharon. And uh, I just want to let you guys know, down in the uh, description and scrolling along the bottom, I have all of Ryan's information. So if you guys want to go follow him on YouTube or social media or even go check out his website, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, The cool thing is, guys, it doesn't matter where you're at in the country. One thing that Ryan provides on his website is a list of literally every card show that is around so you can literally go to any state like for example if you lived in ohio you could click right there and it'll show you every single card show that's coming up the address it'll give you a website to go there and connect just a really really useful tool um so i i just want to shout that out too if you guys are ever looking for card shows or even local card shops he's he's also starting to chart that as well in your area or say you're going on vacation, you know, you might want to check and say, Hey, what's going on in Florida. And then you'd be able to see all of the card shows that are going on in Florida as well. So just a really cool tool guys that if you, you know, are ever looking for that type of thing, there's a website that's constantly updated with that kind of information. Absolutely. And yeah, if you have a show that's not on there, just email me and I'll add it to the site within a week. I just try to have a big category or big directory of all the different shows out there. Mm-hmm. It's too hard. I will say though, it's too hard to keep up with the dates on everything right now. I don't have like a whole on staff, so I don't have the dates on there right now. I'm trying to work on something with that, 
Um, but Good just tip. all the card shows there. So I try to list like a Facebook page or website. You can check that out as well. Yep. Here's a bunch of shops too, guys, depending on what state you're in. Same thing as the shows. It will just kind of go down. Uh, one thing I love to do, and me and Marty are really adamant about this, is we try to hit every single card shop in our area. And then like even in like Northeastern Ohio too, just because it's super close to us and like any of that stuff and try to support the local business as much as possible. I know cards have kind of blown up lately, but like it, it wasn't always like a booming business like this. And a lot of times those guys need our support, especially in like the economy we're living in with COVID, all that kind of stuff. So always love uh, getting out there and being able to show support to local business and these guys that are out there making it possible for guys like us to go to shows. So Absolutely. I think it's really cool. So Ben, how did you get started with vintage? Cause I remember whenever we were talking pre-show, you said it's funny that you collect mainly things that came out like long before you were even born. How did that happen? Yeah. So I pretty much got into vintage because my dad, my dad once to owned an LCS in the nineties and he always preached on like, the overproduction of cards always stick to your goats and all your like your better hall of famers because even in 50 or 60 years from now people want to go out there and buy a mickey mantle card or buy a willie mays card or a sandy koufax they're not going to say oh i don't want a sandy koufax card i've never seen them play or anything like that because your true baseball collectors want to have those cards or their historic cards or art pieces at this point and just references to baseball americana so um, knowing that I just stick to vintage cards. That's my main PC. I like going out there and finding that type of stuff. There's so many cards I need to still have in my collection, especially on the pre-war side. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just because of that. That's awesome, man. What What's the favorite card you have in your collection, whether modern, vintage, or whatever? Yeah, so last Dallas show, I finally picked up a Walter Johnson a tobacco card from T206. Nice. It has a rarer back also. So it was the overprint. And uh, that card is never going to leave my collection. So I was really, really happy about it because I've been chasing a, a Walter Johnson for a very, very long time. And I finally got it through a trade. So I was really happy about it. That's really cool. I actually kind of had the same thing happen at one of the last Pittsburgh shows. I, I had mentioned in a one of my vlogs at one of the local card shops that, you know, one of my like bucket list cards, like not that it's like a bucket list thing because it was only like a two, three hundred dollar item, but like a Terry Bradshaw rookie card like in like the five to six range and i actually had somebody watch the video and they reached out and they were like hey man i have that exact card you want like i can meet you oh, at the card awesome. show and it was just really cool to like be able to meet somebody and like have this like special moment over like a card that like i really wanted for like myself like essentially my whole life because i've always been a stealer like nut and in football like quarterbacks really are the only position to get that long-term love so really it's like bradshaw and big ben and i already had a ton of big ben since you know i was already like basically an adult by the time he was drafted so like i was well on my way to collecting his rookies and stuff like that but you know like terry bradshaw and stuff like the heyday of the super Steelers. like i wasn't even around yet i wasn't born until like 1984 when we sucked so, so like I didn't even catch that whole era of Steeler football. So that's one thing that I've been like kind of focusing on for like my personal PC right now is just collecting uh, decently graded rookie cards of like Bradshaw, Franco, Mean Joe, you know, Lynn Swan, those type of guys and like any kind of autographs and stuff like that I can find as well. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. I mean, I still think a lot of defensive players and other positions are going to get their hobby love one day. Uh, so I still pick up some of the goats with that while they're cheap, but um, definitely right now it's all footballs and even vintage football quarterbacks are so undervalued. If you look at their prices yeah. in comparison to now, like if you're a quarterback in the top 15, their prices go more than some of your top 20 quarterbacks of all time. It makes no sense. Yeah. I, I couldn't, um, couldn't believe how cheap vintage football was today because when I was a kid, like I collected everything, but a lot of like my really, really high end, like, like, rookie cards and stuff when I was a kid were in football because growing up football was always like my favorite sport because the Steelers were my hometown team. And like when you're born in Pittsburgh, they basically swaddle you in a terrible <laughs> town. You know what I mean? So like, I was always like diehard collecting Steelers stuff and like, you know, football for, for the main part, because that was my favorite sport as a kid. And man, like a lot of the stuff I had had just fallen from grace 
But then again, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, which was like the junk wax era where everything was like wildly overproduced. And back then I was like, I tell people all the time when I was a kid, like if if, if there was like a little white on my corner, I was like, man, this is like a gem mint. This is like the greatest <laughs> card ever. You know what I mean? Like it, unless the card had like folds in it or like it looked like somebody rubbed it on the ground, like it was it was a fine card. You know, and uh, it, I, I just like think back to man, like I, I have this binder somewhere at my mom's house that's just full of like my Kobe Bryant collection because I was such a diehard Kobe fan. And like oh, I had man. pages just of that uh, upper deck card that had the sunglasses on his forehead. And like I literally had like all of his rookies in there and like I haven't seen it in years. And then I'm thinking oh, to myself, wow. man, if I even did have that, it'd probably be in horrible condition. But even like, you never know. Uh, uh, PSA six Kobe still probably has some value, but but yeah, I Absolutely. mean back then, man, I was so rough with my cards. Probably compared to like now, it's like now I don't even like want to touch them. I I like pre cut my <laughs> sleeves now just because I'm so worried about dinging a corner. Really? Yeah, Jeez. just just because I don't want to like make anything make the grade go down on them for the most oh, part. I feel you. They're so tough on this new stuff. Definitely. Cool, Deb. I will definitely check that email out right after the show. Matthew, what is up, my guy? Good to see you. He said, big show in New York in that's, August. That's what I've heard. I've been seeing a lot, so I'm trying to work on going up to New York then. Nice. Yeah, man. Like that. Like I said, that's one thing I definitely want to do is be able to eventually, like every single weekend, just go to a different city and do a different show and stuff like that. That would be amazing. That's really cool. Yeah, big shout out to Cordell Stewart, man. Like, yeah, he was awesome to watch. And the, the fun, fun fact about Cordell Stewart, I was actually a ball boy for the Steelers when he was a quarterback for the team. So, you know, I actually got to meet Cordell. He's a pretty cool guy. Art says, there's still shows in Monroeville and Robert Morris. Um, I know for a fact Monroeville just had one just this past month. Uh, there's another one I want to say in October in Monroeville. And um, Robert Morris, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know like uh, the guy that runs the Monroeville shows also does like Greensburg and then he'll do like Youngstown, Ohio and stuff like that as well. Um, so and he's also asking, which sport do you mainly like to collect? Yeah. So my main sport is baseball. I can pretty much tell you mm -hmm. anything and everything with that. And mm -hmm. that's been like my bread and butter for the last uh, 15 plus years. I, dude, I agree, Art. I, I definitely need to find them Kobe's. I, I was going to say baseball with a name like Ryan Nolan. Absolutely. Dude, when you first messaged me, I'm like, I wonder if this is this dude's real name because it was like just like Nolan Ryan backwards. Yeah. So that's you like know, super cool that that's like your real name. Thank you. It's funny, <laughs> though, because I get kicked out of Facebook groups because people think I'm a spammer or a scammer because uh -huh. of the name. That's crazy. August 21st and 2nd. Oh, man, that's the same weekend as Wisdell's. Hofstra University. But I do want to get a different show, and, and I haven't been in New York in a while, so I might end up doing that. I'm going to write that down, though. New but York's probably there. almost as close for me as it would be to, like, Philly. Like, it might be, like, another hour or two to get to New York. So that would be, be a cool little weekend. Do you know how many tables that Hofstra – oh, it's a Hofstra or something like that? Yeah. Hofstra. How many tables that's going to be? I'm not sure. Vescovi probably knows, though. Uh, I'm just writing it down so I can circle back on it. What's up, Owen? He wants to know, uh, are we going to the National? I'm planning on it right now. Um, if for some reason I don't make it, I'll be definitely going to Dallas. But, yeah, I would like to go. A buddy of mine already has a hotel reserved for me. So, as of right now, I plan to be in it, barring, like, some kind of catastrophe or, you know, something else happening that I don't foresee, but I'd love to be there. Yeah. So I am breakout and I should be at the national as well. I just have to confirm with work that I can get those days off. I just started a new job and it should be good. Nice. Okay, cool. Deb you got a lot from the nineties and up. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, the crazy thing is like a, a lot of people say, man, there's nothing you can find good from the 90s. And I'm like, man, like, there's so much from the 90s that has popped this year, like insane, like 
for example, Marvel Universe, 1990 Marvel Universe is like completely crazily hot right now. And I remember selling them for like a quarter a piece at a flea market like two, three years ago. You know what I mean? And it's like, why? Like, what is wrong with me? You know, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's junk wax from the 90s, you know, quarter, you know, <laughs> you know, the thing from the 90s that I still think is way undervalued for some reason in this hobby, Tiffany mm -hmm. cards, because you have the junk wax cards, but these are the limited edition prints. And if yeah. you look at where like the gold cards are or a black border card or anything, that's like zero number today. It's through the roof. Well, Tiffany, they had less than 5,000 of each of these cards. So I went out there and I tried to get most of the Tiffany rookie cards. I mean, I can't afford some of them, like some of the Ken Griffey's or Barry yeah. Bonds, but I got some of your mid tier, upper tier hall of famers, like Randy Johnson, Tiffany, or a Greg Maddox, Tiffany, they're still under hundred dollars for a graded card. You're talking about two of your best pitchers all time. Yeah. Now, do you find that pitchers don't really get the hobby love as like some of the, you know, batters and like big hitters and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I see that a lot. I think that'll eventually change as people become more uh, known with stats. I think like with war, people look at war now and compare players. So I yeah. think over time, people are going to look at war and say, oh, this pitcher is actually really good. Oh, this guy was just as good as like, let's say, I don't know, Albert Pujols or just as good as Mike Trout and say, mm -hmm. well, this guy, this guy's very undervalued. Um, I think it will change. I think the reason why pitchers aren't as valuable, everyone loves the long ball. I mean, there was the one commercial in the nineties. Chicks love the long ball. I can't remember yeah. exactly who was in it. There was like McGuire and a few of the Braves pitchers, but um, still, I think pitchers will get their day. Yep. I, I hope so, man. Cause like, that's my biggest thing with football too, is because like I was a lineman. You know what I mean? So, like, I love, like, wh whenever I see a card of, like, Tony Baselli, Anthony Munoz, um, you know, like, Bruce Matthews, like, any of these guys I grew up watching, like, these were, like, my heroes growing up, man. And, like, they get no hobby love. Like, they're just so disrespected. That, you know what I mean? Like, some of the greatest players to, like, ever grace the trenches. You know what I mean? And it's, like, zero hobby love. You know, so like, and it's the same with baseball, like as far as like a lot of pitchers go, because if you don't have a good pitcher, like how, how competitive can you really be as far as like winning a championship? Like it's a very important position. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And I think some of it also comes down to people talking about the cards because people buy what they hear on YouTube. They'll listen to whatever experts someone says, mm -hmm. they'll go out there and buy the cards. And people are always talking about the quarterbacks are always talking about a home run hitter and they forget about there's other players in the game. But just because, you know, you can't talk about every single player. You have to talk about what's hot at the moment. And maybe this guy's number six or seven on your list, and you only make a top five list. And people just don't know about it because they aren't doing their own research. Yeah. Nice. Matthew just sent in a Tanaka Top's Finest Rookie for grading. That's awesome, dude. That's really I surprised he went back over to, what, Japan instead of playing in America? Yeah. Dude, um... Grunt Dad's working now to deal for uh, three 1997 Pacific Adam Vinatieri rookies. That's there you awesome, go, man. That's really awesome. Exactly, Joel. Joe Thomas, man. I actually used to have a mini helmet of Joe Thomas. I don't know what the heck I ever did. I, I probably sold it because it was a Browns and all my fans – or not my fans. My friends made fun of me for uh, for having a Browns helmet. But, like, when, when you're an offensive lineman and a defensive lineman, like, you look up to, like, other people to play that position. You know what I mean? So, like, Joe Thomas was always one of my favorite players in the league just because of how dominant he was, like, at the position I played. But, yeah, I wish Joe Thomas got some hobby love. You know, my, one of the last shows I was at, like one of the cards I was like drooling over the whole, the whole, the whole day was it was a, um, I don't even remember what set it was, but it was a autographed relic of Brett Kiesel, and the jersey swatch in it had like actual grass stains from Heinz Field on it, and I was just like, oh, that's oh, awesome. But, like, and, and if anybody knows Brett Kiesel, he's the dude that had that big beard hanging out of his uh, helmet and stuff, just super cool guy. But uh, yeah, that was like one of the cards, like it. it doesn't really have a whole lot of resale value and I'm not expecting like the Brett Kiesel market to go wild in the future, but like, that's a guy that like played on the team while I was a ball boy that I got to know and was pretty cool. And like, it's a dirty game used relic. Like there's a piece of Heinz field history, like smeared on that thing, which is just super cool to me. So that's awesome, Art. He says he collected the 96 Fleer medal. Loved the design with the Kobe rookies. He has two. Still hunting the cyber. You know who has the cyber is uh, every day I'm hustling, uh, Nate. He just uh, sent that into PSA. I I'm pretty sure he got an eight on it. 
But uh, Sunday, if you're around 4 p.m. Eastern, we're having a live auction, and I'll tell them to bring it if you're interested in it. I'm pretty sure it's an 8. I'm not positive. I'm pretty sure it may be a PSA 8. But, yeah, pretty cool. That, that set is just amazing. That's one of my favorite sets to collect, too, because when I was a kid, that was one of, like, the hotter NBA sets. It's really cool. And, like, man, like, I got really, really into collecting cards, too, like that 96-97 season when Kobe came out. Like, it was, it was him and Iverson that, like, me and my friends were chasing after like crazy. Now, I hit, like, an initial, like, baseball rush, like, right around, like, the Griffey, like, baseball, football, right around the Griffey, uh, Dion, Barry Sanders, like, era. And then I feel like it cooled off a little bit for me. And then right around the time AI and Kobe came out, it was like, man, that was just, like, where I was just, like, hardcore back into it, you know. And uh, that was right around the time I attended. Uh, I started going to my first Cavs game, too, because um, me and my buddy just got so into basketball around that time and, to this day, I'm still a diehard Cavs fan. Have a quarter season tickets, like you know, and fell in love with the team, you know, and like they sucked almost my entire life, and then they got LeBron and they won a championship. So it's worth it. Thank God for that. Like so I'm a long suffering Pirates fan too, and I don't <laughs> see them winning a championship anytime soon. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Joel. He says Bill Belichick rookie cards are undervalued. My buddy Marty picked up. I want. I want to say probably like ten of them to send out to CSG. Um, so he probably has at least double digits of those out there. But yeah, winning coaches are definitely underrated, man. And th there's a ton of those type of cards, like just like we're talking about the '90s that went off. Like who would have thought? Like a Bill Belichick in a Cleveland Browns jacket card is going to be like valuable one day. Whenever he got famous, not even being on the Cleveland Browns, he got famous for being. You know, yeah, exactly, exactly. So Owen wants uh, to know your thoughts on the six million dollar Babe Ruth. Yeah, well, the, apparently the sale didn't go through. Um, there's a lot of different things with it. Um, there's legal issues right now. I think the SEC still has to approve it, and the Athletic pulled down the article or made a correction and said it wasn't technically a six million dollar sale. Uh, so that's all I'm going to pretty much say about it because there's still probably a lot of legal issues out there with this card, not fully selling. And it's also fractional. They only sold 1% versus the full thing. In my mind, when I look at like a big sale, I think it has to be 100% being there to one buyer that count as the highest sale. So in my mind, the PSA 952 manual is still the biggest card out there. Yeah, that that's an awesome card, man. Like I, do, I, I can only imagine like even being like in – the presence of such a card, you know what I mean? Like, let alone like having like a safe opening up and be like, Oh, there's a mantle. There's a Luau Sindor. There's, you know, a Jim Brown, like, Oh my goodness, man. That that's another one that is on my like bucket list, man. Is that the Brown, a Jim Brown rookie card? Yeah. I finally got it at the was. I, I know. I, I watched your video, man. I was so happy about it, but yeah. I, I gave up my Bob Gibson, which is a little sad, but yeah. Had it that's, happen. That's, that's still really cool though. Like, Man, he, he's one of those guys, like, there's never going to be another Jim Brown. Like, I, I don't care what happens. Like, there's never going to be another player like Jim Brown. But the funny thing, too, about the Jim Brown, I mean, that card has all the potential in the world. It's still for affordable for what he's done. And if you think about classic football cards, I mean, if you think about football cards in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, can you name a bigger card than the Jim Brown? No. Can you name of another player that had as much of an impact on the sport from the 50s through like the 70s or 80s than Jim Brown? No. And if you look at a baseball, if your biggest impact players, let's say Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, look how expensive their cards are. Mm -hmm. Browns are dirt cheap. And the thing about it too is good luck finding a centered one because those 58s are horribly centered. And yeah. more people collected baseball back then than football. Um, I don't know on top of my head, but I'm pretty sure baseball pop reports for 58 or 59 are much higher than the 58 football. Yep. And the crazy thing too is like a lot of like the Hall of Fame caliber running backs that like a lot of people like, you know, that are probably our age and younger would say are probably the best running backs that ever lived. Those guys are like, have you met Jim Brown? Like, you know, what I mean? <laughs> like they, they're the guys saying Jim Brown is that guy. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. It, it, and as a Steelers fan, for me to say Jim Brown is that guy, it's like, you know, like that guy was amazing. Crazy. Amazing, yeah. 
I mean, imagine if that would have been the Super Bowl era. Like, how many Super Bowls would the Browns have had in the Jim Brown era? Like, a lot, because they were dominant during that stretch. Definitely, man. Absolutely. Dude, there's some great uh, tips that PSA Collector came out with as far as, like, that low-hanging fruit stuff and – you know, just like 90s inserts and stuff. And a lot of that stuff was like really before a lot of it started to really pop and stuff like that. So, yeah, definitely a ton of money to be made in that. I agree. That's awesome. What's up, Carson? Good to see you, my man. Big shout out to Carson, the uh, big dog over at Pure Graded X. Roo, roo, roo. Good to see you, man. <laughs> Appreciate you being here. Yeah, man, he, he buys up all kinds of uh, heat, man. He got, he got like, a whole array of, like, LeBron chalk tosses over there. Really? Jeez. Yeah. Really cool, man. Uh, so here's a uh, question here from Art. He says, what are your guys' thoughts on Shohei Otani and the value of his rookies? I'll let you kind of take the reins on that one because I'm not, like, the biggest bat or baseball collector. I basically just, like, grab pirates and stuff. Yeah, so personally, I'm not investing in Shohei Otani. I don't have any of his rookie cards. And here's the reason why. Is he having a great year? Absolutely, I'm not going to deny it. Is he going to be an impact player for the next two or three years? Probably. And I think he could he win an MVP award. Probably. He's 26 or 7 years old right now, and this is his first big season. So if you look at it from a perspective, is he going to make the Hall of Fame? Is he going to have a lasting legacy? It's going to be really tough. I mean, he's going to have to have... 13, 14, 15 years, because not all the Japan stats are going to transfer over. There's voters out there that will not look at the Japan stats since it's still technically a double A, triple A level. And they'll say, well, that wasn't a major leagues. I'm not looking at that. So now you have to compare his career over 10 or 15 years. He's already been a little bit injury prone uh, since he's been called up in 18 and didn't have the greatest stats. So now you're hoping on him banking continual years like this over and over again as he ages and gets older. And I just don't see that happening. I think right now, if you got into him cheap, flip his stuff and then get into some other prospect or get into vintage where it's going to be stable and market over a long-term period else. I don't think you should be buying at the peak. Yeah, that's probably good advice, especially with like younger guys like this that still have a lot to prove. Like one thing that I always think back to and, you know, like my buddy Marty keeps me kind of like level minded because I'm one of them people where I get real impulsive sometimes. And if there's like a deal that like is to be made, like sometimes I like kind of want to force myself to make it. But one thing like he always reminds me is, dude, remember Fred Taylor? Because when we were kids, we used to go to the flea market and my mom would take us every single day or every single um, weekend because there would be this guy that had like the most exquisite like sports code like array I've ever seen for like a mid 1990s kid. Right. And um, I remember like every single week going there and the Fred Taylor is being so expensive. You know what I mean? Like I'd be looking into like, cause that was the same year Randy Moss came out and oh, I, yeah. I was picking up like Heinz Ward and stuff. Cause he was a rookie that year and whatnot. And um, I just remember Fred Taylor being so expensive and one of the first um, cards, like when I was going back through the pandemic and I started saying, you know, I'm going to start selling off some of these cards I've just had sitting around for a while. I, I went and grabbed Fred Taylor. Oh, he must be expensive. I remember he they used to charge an arm and a leg for Fred Taylor. I looked it up and he was like $1.99. I was like, oh, my man. God, what happened to Freddie T? Like, you had a good career, no? <laughs> but like, yeah, I mean, it's just like, man, like what – it's hard if you're not investing in like a top 15 player of all time or something like that for them to kind of maintain that same level of like heat as like, say someone like Zion has right now, you know, I'm sure Anthony Bennett probably had, I don't want to say that level of hype, but like a, a lot of people buying his cards for a lot more than they're worth today when he came out. So, so Grunt, I've been collect. I say I collect 15 years. I agree. I've probably collected longer than that because they've started <laughs> when I was really early in elementary school or even earlier than that, my dad used to take me to flea market. So I'm 23 right now. I'm just assuming I started like five, six or seven. I don't know. So I'm 15 years. Nice. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. I I've probably been collecting Thanks, pretty, pretty close. Um, 
I'd say like at least at least twenty years, but that's with me taking some time off, like during like the high schoolish years, like most guys do for the most part. So yeah, I was like super big into it all the way up through middle school. Beginning of high school was like kind of when I started to tail off, and then like LeBron came out literally like the year I like right after I graduated. I graduated in 02. LeBron came out in 03. So like it was like right there. I was a Cavs fan, so it was like I had a reason to collect cards again. So um, I got right back into it like after a few years off. I want to say what's up to Spider. Appreciate you being here, my man. David Mercer's in the house as well. Appreciate you being here, David. Yep. Um, Carson wants to know, what do you think about scooping up uh, Chrome Refractor Retro Baseball Rookies? Um, they are cheap, cheap until they aren't. I mean, like 90s refractors. I mean, like the Vlad Guerrero, Woman's Best, 95, his refractor is really expensive. I know some of the other ones are as well, so I don't know if they're cheap, cheap. Uh, right now with 90s stuff, I still say stick your Tiffany because you still have some of your greatest players of all time, and they're pennies on the dollar compared to some of the refractors. Definitely. Hey, what's up, Ziggy? Ziggy, what's up, my guy? Good to see you, bro. Always a pleasure. Ziggy puts out some good content too, man. He, he does really good knowledge. At, every single day he's uploading too, mm -hmm. and it just you. There's not anyone else out there that has that consistency. Yep, that's why he sports cards daily. He's there on that go. grind. Absolutely, dude. That that's exactly it, Ziggy. And like anybody that has a sports card YouTube channel, like your analytics will tell you <laughs> that women don't have to do with sports card for the yeah. most part. Like but, you have your select few that are like really into it, which like to me, like that's the unicorn, right? Isn't isn't that the lady of all of our dreams that like collects cards harder than we do? Like, oh, you mean you're gonna go out there and pick up like X, Y, and Z? Yeah, baby. You know, I want to go pick up X, Y, and Z. Like that, that's the dream. Well, let's let's see this demographics right now. I have one point four percent of my viewers are girls. I have 05 percent, like ninety nine point five percent of my demographic are men. But then that's again, you're funny. a much more handsome gentleman than I. Am. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why you got the extra point. Maybe <laughs> they watch me instead of the cards. Yep, yep. You got that eye candy for them. Absolutely. Pisto, appreciate you being here all the way from Australia. Appreciate it. Uh, would you recommend investing in LaMelo Ball long term? What's your take on Melo? Honestly, I don't follow the new basketball stuff. I stay away from it. I mean, look at how much the new basketball stuff has been crashing. I try to stay more conservative with my picks. So I I got one LaMelo Ball rookie before, and I flipped it because it was like $15 cheaper, and that's all I've done with it. I think it just depends on like what – cards you have of Lamelo, like i think if you're gonna have something that's shorter population you'd probably be safe with a guy like Lamelo. like I, i'm not predicting he's gonna be a top 15 player of all time but i'm thinking his card's still gonna have value five years from now so like he's one of the guys where if i get like a nice short print or i end up getting like an autograph or something i'll probably stash it and gamble a little bit with him like I, I've told people before, like one of the guys I'm real bullish on is just Ja Morant, just because I love the way he plays. So it's like I, I'm basically gonna like take the ride with Ja. Like I went out and I bought one of his like rookie autos out of Prism, and I was like, I'm gonna hold this card for a minimum of like five, six, maybe even eight to ten years, just depending on how Ja Morant's like career projection goes. Like obviously he could take that Derrick Rose route where he goes down and he's not the same type of player. But I think Lamelo is like that same type of cat though that really has a lot of natural ability. I already think he's a better pro athlete than Lonzo. And I think Lonzo is a really, really good player. I just don't think that you know I don't think Lonzo has like the top fifteen all time potential like um Lamelo might, but uh I, I like Melo. Like long story short, I, I think he's a good pickup if we can get past like the whole overpopulation conversation that we've been kind of stuck on for the last year, as far as like you know junk slab era and stuff like that. As far as just overgrading and stuff with say Zion, like his population is like literally like 10x what LeBron's is, like literally just 20 years Crazy. later. And then you go back into the 90s, and it's like even though that population of cards was extremely like a way overproduced even those cards are less graded than like a lot of these modern cards so 
that's something that we kind of got to keep in mind too is just like populations and stuff like that so that's one of the biggest things with the younger guys where most of the young guys i just kind of flip so that i can go get guys like terry bradshaw that i want for my pc or like i flipped a lot of young guys to go out and get my uh paper lebron rookie whenever i got that but that's kind of what i do is i'll kind of like build the cards i really want in my collection based off of like a lot of the young prospecty type players and i'll kind of let somebody else gamble and kind of possibly be stuck with the bag if that makes sense <laughs> Because if I get stuck with a Steeler, Cavalier, like any kind of Pittsburgh type of card, like I'm happy. I don't care. I have like a really sick Anthony Bennett, like RPA collection. And he's like widely known as probably the biggest bust in NBA history. And it's like he was a Cav. So like I, that's cool. <laughs> Plus, we got to dump him off on Minnesota before he busted. So I'm happy about that too. Theodore, what's up, man? Good to see you. Appreciate you being here. Said so ultra modern basketball cool into eighty nine pro set football, yeah, um, maybe not wrong there. I mean, the quality has not been like super great either. But then again, like that's been kind of the same across a lot of the sports now. Um, Panini's been really bad though lately. Like, I don't know if you've seen a lot of these select cards like that have been I coming have. out. Like, dude, Horrible like they are. Ever. Oh my god! Like even like the edges like are horrible looking. Like, I don't, I don't know what, like, what they're doing with their quality control. Like, if maybe they're on vacation or maybe they're shut down with PSA. <laughs> I, th I think I think all the companies are just way, way over the top right now. They don't know what to do with I this production it. levels, with all the demand right now. I mean, who would have predicted cards would have done this in the last two, three years? I mean, if you look at the, at the 2010s, the cards were kind of dead. I mean, their card shows were like 30, 40 vendors, if that, maybe yeah. once a month in your city. Obviously, there's still the national, and I didn't go to the national back then, so I can't tell you how the national back then compared to the 2019 or the one that's coming up over here. There's yeah. a lot of other people that are on YouTube and other collectors that probably could tell you really easily, but it was just a completely different scene. I mean, you could pick up Kobe rookies for five, ten dollars, and that was hard to get rid of. Yeah. Grunt Dad uh, says, Do you like to buy raw grade flip, or what's your strategy normally when you pick up cards? So I use tr cards more for like trade bait. I do flip some cards. So if I go to a show and I see like a newer slab that's like 50 bucks and it sells for eBay, I mean, it's free money at that point. I'm going to buy it for $50 and then either put it into a trade or sell it at that point to get some capital. Um, I do grade some cards as well. I have like 300 cards at PSA, but I have not gotten back one graded order yet. So I haven't done any of that strategy. And most of the cards at PSA anyways are vintage cards that I picked up for the last 10 or 15 years. So most of them are really high grade, like seven, eights, and I hope some nines, but who knows how that is. Um, so they're going back into my PC unless they're like sixes and I'll just end up trading them out. Um, but mostly I flip a few things that shows. I do prospect a little bit. I follow a lot of baseball stats, minor leaguers as well. So I'll try to get into players cheap at let's say a quarter or a dollar. Hope they go up to five, ten dollars and then sell a few of them. Um, but that's mainly the most way I do it right now. Carson says he's been buying a lot of 90s to 2012 baseball refractors of Griffey, Maguire, Jeter, Bonds, the older stuff, about 5 to $10 card is kind of like where he likes to be. He likes to speculate like rarity, low pop, low inventory, that kind of stuff, high eye appeal. Yeah, I think that's definitely yeah, something. Is. That's something that sports card um, – or no, graded card investor now um, – former PSA collector that kind of opened my eyes to is the whole eye appeal thing. He did a video like when he was talking about the low hanging fruit and he was kind of just talking about like, if a card looks just super cool, it's probably going to be a little bit more desirable, especially if it's a little more rare, which a lot of like the nineties inserts were a lot less shorter printed than like a lot of the base cards and stuff like that as well. I was yeah. going to talk about eye appeal with vintage cards too. Cool. So a lot of people, a lot of people don't know with like the eye appeal side of things. Um, Two cards that are graded, let's say PSA five, aren't the same. Um, it all depends on the eye appeal. If something centered, it looks sharper, it has a better picture. That card demands a more of a premium than another PSA five that doesn't. Um, just because a card has a numerical grade assigned to it doesn't mean it's worth that X amount of money. Now I know with modern cards, since most of them all look nines and tens look about the same, sure you can apply that philosophy. But when you're going back into vintage, uh, yeah. it all depends on eye appeal. I mean. For me personally, there could be a four that looks nicer than a five. I'd rather have that four in my collection, even though it's assigned a five or four grade rather than that five. 
Um, so yeah. there's a lot of other vintage collectors that share that same philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you're looking at eye appeal, look towards that rather than just looking at what a numerical grade is. Say what's up to Dave. Appreciate you being here, my man. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your support. Thanks, David. Got Alan in the house too. How's it That's going, Alan? It's Hashik. This man pulls all of the fire. Uh, every Friday night, he does breaks on the uh, Pure Graded X Instagram really? page. Th this dude just pulled me a Trey Lance auto. Uh, what was it on Sunday, Alan, or was it Friday? One, one of the last two breaks, he pulled me a Trey Lance, and I'm still on cloud nine. Dang. And that's like a week after, no, two weeks after he pulled me a Halliburton auto, which I'm still pretty pumped about. But, uh, yeah, I call him Hot Hands Hoshik. <laughs> <laughs> Good dude, man. Alan Bailey, man. If you guys uh, aren't, you uh, aren't following him over on Instagram, make sure you go check him out as well. Yeah, Ma Matthew says, I love them hands. Yep. What did he get you, a Jordan Love rookie or something like that, that one week? Yeah, he pulls, like, disgusting cards like it's going out of business like he pulled a justin herbert like crystal auto and then he pulled a jason dominguez one of one gold auto it's like this guy doesn't know how to pull duds although there's probably because guys like me buy up all the duds <laughs> <laughs> well the crazy thing was i uh, actually opened some cards the other day and i two packs in a row i hit a trevor lawrence i was like, really this That's like awesome. literally never happens to me. Walk, walk away at that point. It's like the casino gambling. When you when you're on top, you just gotta stop. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Yep, Jordan Lovato, definitely, my man. So I wanted to ask you too about um, finding fake cards and like what are some ways, especially with like vintage stuff and like even some newer stuff. What are some ways to kind of spot a fake card and like what would you have somebody that's new to the hobby look for? Yeah. So the first thing I'm going to recommend, if anyone goes to card shows, buy a loop. So there's a ton of different loops on Amazon or eBay. Most of them are like $10, $15. Buy one of these because these are your best friends. Now, what you want to really look for is the printing details. Now, do your research before you buy any card expensive that is raw. And even with graded stuff, please do your research when you're going into vintage because just because it's in a slab case, there's a lot of fake slabs out there. And there's also people like... A, I'll say, for example, there are fake cards in PSA slabs or Beckett slabs or SGC or CSG, like any other company. There are cards that do slip through the system. Like these grading companies are almost perfect, right? 99.9%, .9%, but nothing is perfect. And there's a few that do fake and get thrown in there. So number one thing is get a loop and always check the printing details. Now, one thing you'll notice on a lot of the fake counterfeit cards is they're always pixelated because what someone does is they take a picture of that card and then they try to reprint it. So they'll put it back on that card. And when you look under a loop, I know it's not gonna show on camera, you'll see pixelation rather than solid lines. And because of that, you know that this card is fake. Now, newer cards have a different printing process. You have to look at the years and examine it, uh, but know the printing in the past, they're gonna be very solid colors and everything like that. Now, another thing that you wanna take a look at under the loop as well is if a card's trimmed or not. So I'll just give you a, a, a example right here. I have a video on my channel, which goes in more details, but I have a Carl Hubble here from a 1940 play ball. And then I also have a Mel Ott right here. Now, if you're going through a card show really fast, you might not think this card is trimmed. looks pretty nice, right? A 1940 card has some eye appeal and everything like that. But then if you look at the Carl Hubble, you see how it has that extra border that goes around. Mm. So someone went through, took scissors to the card. I went cut, 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 cut. Cut, cut. Well, my friends gave me this card to show on the channel, like how it was cut up and everything like that. And you look under a loop. Also, you can tell that there's scissor marks applied to the Mel Ott card going around. Uh, I can't really explain it. You just have to look at some trim cards and take a look at that as well. Um, so I'd recommend if you're going to buy an expensive card, get a cheap common as well from that year, because no one's going to try to fake a 10 cent card or a quarter card. That way you can feel how thick the stock is. You can look at the printing details and then see if that matches up with another card. Um, great example with that. Another example over here. So this Yager card used to be like a $5 card a while ago. And yeah, I know, I know it's exploded recently, yeah. right? Yep. I just sent a few of those into PSA, like literally right before it happened. Great. I was like, great, hey, great right there. <laughs> oh, I got two of them. And this one I didn't end up sending because it's trimmed. So mm -hmm. here's another one, the Mike Modano. And I never thought someone would trim this card in my life. I measured these up. Mm -hmm. It's trimmed. And then on this card itself, again, really hard to show on video right now. Yeah. Uh, but the card goes from up here 
down and then up. So that means someone wow. went over there and tried cutting the edge because there's an edge issue yeah. and then try to make it like that. And you can see how off centered it is from the top to bottom as well. Yeah. And when I lined it up to any other card, um, a modern card or anything like that, let me just try to find a modern card real quick. I can line it up with. Yeah. Thought you do that. Smile. Mike was uh, saying great guest. Uh, he recently just started following you and he loves all the vintage stuff you put out. Hey, yeah, I mean, thank you, Mike. That, I really appreciate it. That's huge to have that because the, the, the vintage market is not as well covered on YouTube. And like Ryan puts out some really great stuff guys in regards to that. Dave says the same thing. You can really tell a lot by the feel of the card as well. So I'll just give you an example. Like there's the Chipper Jones rookie. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think this might be a little larger card. Hold on. I'll just show it with the PSA slab. It's a little harder because it's slabbed up. Um, but when you line them up, it's a little bit shorter. That's going to be hard to show on here. Um, so that's another way that you can take a look at it. It's not perfect, by the way. A lot of vintage cards, there's different ways that they were cut, especially in your T206 cards. So there are variations uh, between the different sizes. Um, but you can also look up what the average size is online if you look up a specific set. And you can measure them out with the ruler and see if there's any differences. But just be aware that there are trim cards out there. There are especially a lot of trim cards and older slabs because the different companies didn't check for trimming. The first card ever graded by PSA was a trimmed card. And not a lot of people realize that. The famous T206 Hannes Wagner, it was trimmed. I think the guy's name was Bill Mastro or something like that. Mm -hmm. Very, very, he was really, really big in the industry. I think he had his own auction house and everything yeah. like that. Can no longer be associated with sports cards because he trimmed a ton of those tobacco cards. Wow. So be careful, even when you're buying stuff in slabs, make sure that wasn't trimmed. Yeah, that, that's that's something really uh, useful to know, especially with like some of the older slabs too. Like you mentioned, like an older PSA slab or even like older Beckett slabs or something like that for that matter. I, I know a lot of guys that have big cards, like you mentioned the the Hannes Wagner, like Michael Jordan, like that type of stuff, like. You know, I, I've actually talked with a couple guys that had that kind of inventory out of card shows, and they were talking about, like, yeah, they they probably will reholder a lot of those just to get, like, the new hologram and stuff like that because a lot of the people that are looking to buy it from them, they want that because that proves it's authentic because yeah. that, before PSA went and did that or whatever. 100%, company, for that matter. 100% I agree with that. Not holograms, I will say be careful out there. There's a new fake. Um, but it's pretty easy to spot. The hologram isn't is like printed on a paper rather than showing it. So if you know that normal PSA hologram, let me grab one right now. It reflects really well. If you take a look at it, someone replicated these cases right now and it doesn't reflect. Um, also on these cases themselves, the inside of the paper on here is thinner. So it doesn't go all the way to the edges. And one other thing to take a look at on the back, the QR code right here isn't aligned up on the counterfeit. So you can see this one right here. It's all the way aligned over to the left. Some of the counterfeits, it's centered instead. Um, so there's a few other details that you can look at in these slabs to make sure. But the biggest thing when you're going out to card shows or buying on eBay, do your research. Just don't blindly buy a card because that's the best way you can get burned. If you're not familiar with the set, not familiar with the printing process, reach out to someone that does have that card or reach out to other buyers on eBay and ask them how you can determine if a card is real before you spend $1,000 or $5,000 because you're not always guaranteed to get that money back. And you might not find the buyer or the find the seller. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, Theodore says there's a ton of those 89 hoops David Robinson yep. or Connor Fitz floating around. The 84 update as well. Correct. Uh, so do you do you find that vintage stuff is faked a lot more than newer stuff? Or do you find it being the other way around? Right now, so if you buy cards on like Facebook, I see so many fake Steph Curry or LeBron James 2003 and what like 2010, I think for Steph mm -hmm. flooded throughout Facebook and same with the uh, Tom Brady and the Mike Trotz. I see them almost any day I go throughout Facebook. Um, but when you go out the card shows, there are fake vintage cards and that tends to happen with some of the different tobacco cards. Uh, let's say a new seller just knows modern stuff and someone comes in here with a vintage tobacco card, something they're unfamiliar with. They might buy yeah. this card for two, three thousand dollars and then they don't know it's fake. What do they do? They just throw it out there. It is what it is at that point. I don't agree with it. Um, so they need to figure out, you know, is this card real or fake? And that's kind of why I'm building out this content. So people, if you're at a card show or you're a dealer or anything like that, you can become educated. You have this resource available. 
Now, if you want to look up a 1968 Nolan Ryan rookie card, go to the channel. It's right there as well. And then eventually at the end of summer, I should have my book out as well, which is going to have 100 different fakes of some of the most popular cards. So that's awesome. still have a lot to go with that. I'm still writing out a lot of that content, making sure I get those videos out. So I hope to have the video resource available as well as the book. I think with the book, I'm going to start off with a PDF format. And then if that ends up doing well, I'll end up getting a hard copy uh, so people can have that and use that as a resource. That's really awesome, man. I, I think that's really useful information too. I think that's something that'd be really valuable for like hobby shops and stuff like that to like offer something like that to newer collectors that, I mean, like, cause right now the hobby is so hot and a lot of the, the heat is driven by a lot of new people back into the hobby or people that just came back after, you know, a hiatus of so many years. So I think the fact that there's someone like you putting out information that anybody can find, you know, like, how do I spot a fake whatever and boom out of nowhere you find, you know, breakout cards on YouTube and, you know, just a, a wealth of information, you know, Thank really you. cool. Really cool. So yeah, guys, make sure you go check him out. And again, check out his website too, because if you're looking for card shows or local card shops in your area, he does have a list of, I'm pretty sure everyone in the area as of right now, he did say he's trying to work on dates and, times and stuff like that but there is links to their websites and stuff as well too so it's great really great uh tool as well appreciate dave it says he's gonna go check you out right after this awesome awesome yeah dave's a good guy he knows baseball really really well he's normally the guy that whenever i pick up a baseball card and i don't know nothing about it i'm like dave what is this <laughs> that's perfect yep definitely but yeah I definitely appreciate all the information you've shared tonight, man. Is there anything coming up over in your channel that you'd like to promote or anything that, you know, we can, you know, let people know about for you? Yeah. I mean, I just say to stay subscribed to the channel. I'm trying to work out uh, logistics. I'm going to try to fly out to the San Francisco show later this month. I don't have any West coast shows yet. And mm -hmm. I think this is like the biggest large show over there since COVID. So it'd be kind of interesting to see how everything operates over there. Now, I already kind of think in my mind a lot of things are going to be overpriced because it is San Francisco, a lot more modern stuff and hype. But I'm going to keep an open mind and see how it is. I know there's a lot of creators out there in California, a lot of YouTubers. Yeah. So that's a good networking opportunity no matter what. Put out some content and have some fun with that. And yeah. then next month is going to be crazy. I mean, yeah, I'm going to go to an Iowa show one week before nationals. I have nationals. And then I'm either going to Dallas, Atlanta, or both um, that weekend. So I'm still working out the logistics on that one as well. But We'll see how that goes. Dave wants to know where you're out of. So I'm out of Orlando. Yep. Most magical place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Is. Alan, said, Alan said that's his place, Cali. Yep. That, that's one of the places I want to get to. I told Alan, man, he needs to set up some shows. Me and him hit the road over there. That'd be, oh. that'd be awesome, bro. I want to go to the, be. he's like super close to those spots where uh, Sasha T goes all the time. Like the Mel Burbank Rose and Burbank. Yeah. Yeah, he's like it out one day. To yeah. Me too, man. Like a lot of these things I've been seeing, man, like a lot of these shows that I've watched on YouTube, man. Like I, like I said, that that's my goal. I've, eventually I want to be able to do exactly what you're doing right now. So uh, yeah, Thank I love you. the, I love the stuff you're putting out, man. It inspires me and, Honestly, like a lot of the editing and stuff like that's like really as a creator, it's nice to see like the way other people portray the kind of stuff that you like to do. Because if it's me, if I'm sitting there editing a video, like my favorite thing to put out is card shows. So like that, oh, I, it's that's why I really like fun. watching them too. They're a pain to edit, I'll tell you that. I mean it's, it's like 10, 12 hours alone on the editing thing, or if not more, because with all the clips and Oh yeah, organizing it, but dude, and the way fun. you edit it too, like you're like a professional editor. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. say that, but I'm getting, I'm trying to get there. Well, I, I'm a novice, man. I'm like literally self-taught. My buddy Nate, every day I'm hustling, like got me on uh, Filmora kick. So like now it's like I'm getting a little bit better every single time I do one, but like I'm still nowhere near where I need to be. <laughs> You'll but, get there. Yeah, definitely, man. But again, I, I definitely appreciate you coming on this evening, guys. If you would go over no and check problem. out Ryan's channel and his social medias and stuff, all that is scrolling below, but I have it in the description of this video as well. So make sure you go over there. Tell him Pittsburgh sent you. I'd appreciate it. And uh, I guess we'll see you later on, guys. Tomorrow we'll have a fire sale on my channel. So around 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll probably release that video. So if anyone's interested, it's five dollar sale all of marty's 
like El Fuego. So, <laughs> but again, go check out my buddy Ryan. He's putting out some really great content as well. Hey, thank you for having me on. And if anyone has any questions, email me or message me on Instagram, Twitter. I respond to everything, or I, at least I try to. There's a lot of things that come in, but I try to answer all you guys' questions and everything. Yep. Like that. And you got a Discord as well, too. So I do. Yeah. It's over on Discord. If you want to check out Breakout Cards over there on Discord as well. He was gracious enough to give me an invite. So I hang yep. out over there once in a while as well. So. Uh, we'll see you guys later. Again, thank you for the support. And uh, go check out my guy over.